leads and the emotions follow. And I thought this was funny. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man or an adult, I put away childish things, right? So it's in, in this, this continuum of, of understanding uh, what God has revealed to us in human personality, it's not just logic, and it's not just emotions, but emotion is, sub, is in subjection to thinking. And reason is guiding our passions. So that um, even in this scripture, 2 Corinthians 10 5, it says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Amen. So to me, that's been part of the way I've had to live my life. I can't live by my just my emotions. God is called mature Christians to live by the principle of his word and to um, and the mind has to be over the emotions because because he wanted to preserve the image of God as he created it God has also provided for the distinction of the sexes and now we're going to talk about a, a subject that we almost never talk about uh, at least not anymore because modern day practice has been eroding the distinction between the sexes but God's word provides us some guidelines so as his ambassadors on um, on this planet what can we learn from these guidelines remembering that uh, the head of, the, of Christ is God but head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. This time, notice that Christ is the head of man. And can we trust a man or a husband if he, if Christ is the head of him? Yes, yes if, if I certainly can. can I? And also notice that God is the head of Christ because of the incarnation when Jesus came as a man. And he, Jesus, was subject to who? His father even though he was equal to his father. So I'm learning that a wife's position is very much like Christ's in this present world, and it's a voluntary submission, uh, still knowing that in God's sight and plan that I've been redeemed from any curse, that I'm an equal participant in God's grace, I can still submit to my husband for the smooth running of the family. Just like Jesus submitted himself, made himself lower but, than the angels, but still he is King of kings and Lord of lords. A wife who knows that her husband is the image and glory of God, notice that he's the image and glory of God. A wife who knows that her husband is the image and glory of God will do everything in her power to, to ensure that he sits with the elders in the, uh, um, you know, in, in that Proverbs 31 thing, Proverbs 31, virtuous woman, not just a thing, that she has supported her husband so that he is able to be there in a ministering position. She'll back him and support him with consistency all the days of his life. Likewise, um, the woman is the glory of the man. The husband who knows that his, that his wife is the glory of the man, or of him, will do all he can to ensure that she develops her talents to the fullest in the service of her family and her community and for God. He's not going to, nobody's want, want their wife to look, um, look like she's not, not a full developed person. It's when she is who she's been created to be that the husband goes, I'd like you to be my wife, <laughs> right? And in that sense, she is the glory of man. Not a trophy wife, though. There are so many things that the, the world puts out that's um, kind of different than what we're thinking. But in this distinction of the sexes, and I know that somebody's going to be mad at me, but if you are, please come and tell me. Don't tell the pastor. <laughs> Um, in case you didn't know that this was in the Bible, here it is. And it says that in Ezekiel, chapter 44, verse 20 and 21, they shall neither shave their heads 
nor let their hair grow long, but they shall keep their hair well trimmed. No priest shall drink wine when he enters the inner court. Here it is right here, talking about God's men, that they're not supposed to shave their head with a razor ball, which is very popular these days. And a lot of people do that because it makes their life easier. However, God gave them some hair, and if they still have them, they're supposed to do something about keeping their hair well trimmed, and but they're not, men are not supposed to have their hair real, real long. So, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15, it says, But if a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her. Now, by the way, you can be sure that whatever woman who's here today or anywhere else thinks that she has the shortest hair in the room or whatever, she still has a style that's a feminine style. And if that style was on her husband or another man, we would say, that looks odd. <laughs> so I don't care how short or your long hair your ear, hair is today, I'm sure that you have made your hair part of being a woman. And uh, if it wasn't, then all these beauty shops would be out of business, right? So, so now you can talk to me about that later. But God is uh, just trying to combat the confusion of the sexes. And um, God addresses the clothing issue to continue the assurance that outwardly the distinction of the sexes will be preserved. This was it back in Deuteronomy. Woman's not supposed to wear uh, man's clothing. Man's not supposed to put on woman's clothing. What do we call this? We call this trans... Uh, cross-dressing. That's right. There's not supposed to be cross-dressing going on. Men are supposed to look like men. Women are supposed to look like women. And remember, it's these hard distinctions that the full spectrum of the character of God is expressed. Mm -hmm. So if everybody looks what we call unisex, then guess what? We, don't, we no longer reflect male and female. We're no longer reflecting the whole character of God. And that's what this is about. So think about this part just a little bit with me. Um, the strength of a courageous father and the tenderness of a mother are all part of the love of God. I'm not saying that women aren't courageous or men aren't tender, but those, those aspects of God's personality are out there in, in the stereotype of a, of a mother and a father. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so the man also by the woman, but all things of God. So we know that Adam was created first. He came out from him, from his own DNA. And as wonderful as that is, guess what? The next child that was born came out of the woman. So it's all, all, all things are of God. So we're not talking about uh, somebody coming up and... This man, I was supposed to be done. <laughs> I'll get done right away. I'm just going to let these images speak for themselves without too much comment. As well as these images. As we share this glorious gospel with our family and community, we'll soon find out that we are in a politically incorrect minority who still believes in a definition of marriage as being between a man and a woman. And we believe in that. And other people, let alone they don't even believe in marriage. Satan has planned the obliteration of the sexes. Do you know what obliteration means? It means he wants to totally wipe out any difference between male and female. He wants a, a non-declaration of gender so that the modern day residents of Sodom can camouflage their lifestyle by living in the mainstream of society and never have to call it sin. But sin by any other name is still sin. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it is a deformation of the character and the image of the true living God. God created the male and female, and his character is revealed in the in inherent distinctions he created. If we believe he has called us all to proclaim his forgiveness and his present truth about his soon coming, we all have work to do, and we must not let our gender differences present us with an excuse to not share the gospel everywhere we go. Oh, I'm a woman. I, I get to stay at home. I don't have to. I don't have to do my calling for Matthew 28:19. Oh, I'm a man. I work, and uh, I, I have too much to do. So, um, you know, that's women's work. Let them go out and do that stuff door to door or whatever. No, our gender does not exempt us from the calling that God has given us. He's an equal opportunity employer. Amen. However. 
Our material, the enemy has sown the seeds of discords in our home where the right to earn money has become the obligation to work outside the home and to let our youth raise themselves by use of television programs pretty much or now social media, kids are left alone. Uh, likewise, the, the, uh, our materialistic society has reached its tentacles into our home with a violent result. Well, you used to have to only have a car, now you have to have two cars and you have to have a boat. You used to have to only have two cars and a boat, now you have to have two cars and a boat in a summer home. You used to have to only have two cars and a boat, now you have to have two cars and a boat in a summer home, and... Go in the blank. <laughs> oh my. It's materialistic, and, and money is one of the biggest reasons for divorce, people not being able to solve that problem. So divorce, then you end up with the custody battles and the children being separated from their parents, and it is the destruction of the home, and that's Satan's plan. All because we can't figure out who does what when. Who does what when is one of the keys to running a home smoothly, to running a church smoothly. Who does what when. However, there's some good news about marriage. It also real, realizes that the divorce rate among those active in the church is 27 to 50 percent lower than among non-church goers. Uh, Feldman's hope is that once people learn the truth, they will spread it far and wide. Because you know it's been reported, oh, 50 percent of the marriages, even the Christian marriages, end in divorce. And so people have given up their hopes that, that marriage is even a viable uh, thing to even try. But that is not a true statistic. So why? When you're connected to the vine, you're going to have you're going to have the help you need. So if we pray together, we're going to stay together. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Ephesians 5, 25, 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And that's the goal. That's the goal. Amen. So I think the call would be that uh, if you have a way of preserving your role in God's church as men and women that reflect the image of God, listen to that call. Be all the man you can be, be all the woman you can be, because we've all been signed up to be in God's army. Amen. 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 Oh yes, our closing hymn will be number 335, What a Wonderful Savior.